You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to episode 36 of our show, where we discuss the latest news about Apple, iPhone, iPad, Mac, Apple Watch, Apple TV, and more. We're recording on Thursday, October 1st, 2015. Do you need a website? Why not do it yourself with Wix.com? No matter what business you're in, you can get your site live today. With hundreds of templates and easy drag-and-drop features, it's simple to customize and there's no coding needed. You don't need to be a programmer or designer to create something beautiful. Go to wix.com and create your own stunning website. It's easy and free. With me today is our roaming vagabond, Dan Aaron Dilger. Hey, Dan. Hi, from uh, Portland, Oregon. That's where I'm at right now. Welcome. Not nearly as exotic as some of the locations you've been recently. Uh, yeah, I've been traveling around. <laughs> well, we're glad you're here today with us. And Mikey Campbell calling in from Honolulu. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so th- this is interesting. We were talking about this a little bit before we began recording. Uh, Mikey, you, you've got numerous 6S, 6S Plus devices. And, and Dan, you've had the review unit. So can we just talk about this a little bit? Sure thing. How, what, what did you get, Mikey? Me? Yeah, you. Um, I got a 6S and a 6S Plus, and then another 6S for fun. <laughs> then I'm going to return. <laughs> so you have two 6S's and a 6S Plus. Yeah. Why, why did you get the for fun device? Um, just to make sure that I got one. It was uh, That was my pre-order. Um, 6s and it had a different um, shipping address than the uh, other two that I ordered so it was just a it was just a safety a backup right so how did you acquire your other devices then um I I went through the uh, checkout process again with a new address oh okay so you didn't go and wait in line at an Apple store no no you weren't at Ala Moana mall waiting in line no right? I did that last year for the last time, I think, hopefully. Okay. And Dan, which devices do you have? I have last year's 6 and 6 Plus, and then I have both the 6S and the 6S Plus. All right. And let me ask, what, what device, Dan, do you think is going to be your primary device? Well, last year I had both of them, and I was trying to give them equal time, and I had a really hard time picking up the 6 Plus just because it was so big. And I kept using the 6 thinking that at some point I would sync them up and, and try using the bigger phone. And I just never got around to it until I had the 6 stolen in Hong Kong. <laughs> and um, that kind of forced me to use the 6 Plus. And I have hated using the big phone, but I can't stop using it. Uh, I, I now set up the with the, the new S models, I have the 6S Plus that I'm using all the time. And I'm trying to give some you know, specific time to the 6S, smaller one. And it's hard to, uh, hard to go down. It's kind of a, a thing of once you get a certain expectation. The, the physical size of the bigger phone is annoying. It's difficult. I mean, it's not hard to put in your pocket, but when you're walking around and you know, you're sitting in the park and it's kind of trying to squeeze out um you're on a roller coaster (laughs) um it's just bigger and the biggerness is a downside but it's really difficult even though the smaller the 4.7 inch s model or the 6s um it's kind of the perfect size it's uh, almost a little bit too big i have huge hands but um it's a little bit bigger than you know the classic iphone 5 size that makes it a little bit of a reach it's not much of reach for me but the 6 Plus really puts, pushes it beyond that. So it, it's kind of an, an irritation to try to reach the top. I find when I'm doing things like maps, when I'm trying to hit the top button, um, it's just, it doesn't always register. And I, d- I don't think to use reachability a lot, where you double tap the home button and pulls it down. It seems like kind of an extra step. So it's kind of a, a, a difficult struggle. <laughs> but um, I, it's... It's not enough to make me go down from the larger screen. I, it, it's so nice to be able to see things really clearly, and especially when you're taking pictures. And 
anytime you're looking at anything from the map to a web page, the extra screen real estate is great. So it's kind of it's kind of where I am. I can't go down and I can't. So you're you're conflicted, but you're staying with the large device. Yes. Hey okay. Dan, ha have you found that the 3D touch kind of um, helps alleviate some of that largeness as far as uh, like like say uh, hyperlinks? You can kind of preview, you know, the peak peak and pop. You can preview them without clicking on them and having to swipe back or hit the back button. Yeah, it's a new la layer of navigation. I haven't really given a yeah. thought about making it easier to use a bigger phone. That's an interesting idea. Um, there's certainly I, options, you, uh, like you're saying, that there's certainly shortcuts yeah. you can take that you're not having to right. reach up as far. Right. Yeah, but, I mean, for me, my hands are, are tiny. I have elf hands, so um, take what I can get. And I've found that with the 6S Plus, I've been using 3D Touch a lot um, just to preview things instead of actually diving into them like you know for example if, if i was on ai's website or a home page and then i wanted to you know check out an article earlier in the day i on a six i would or the six plus i would go in tap the uh, hyperlink and then have to um, swipe back whereas with the 6s plus i can just use the peak mode and read it on screen and release my finger and i'm still on the uh, home page I haven't noticed it so much with peek and pop, but the quick actions on home icons are like that for me. Um, yeah. For example, when you do a lot of times when you open maps, what you're really wanting to do is search for something. So when you do a deep action and you know, quick action, if you do search nearby when you launch maps, then the cursor is already in the top menu bar. You don't have to open maps mm -hmm. and then reach your thumb up to the top of the screen to hit that target. And it's the same thing with. Um, camera if you want to do a selfie instead of opening the camera and uh, reaching to the very top for, to turn the camera around um, you can just do that quick action where you press and say take a selfie and you're already in selfie mode yeah right right you know what kind of irritates me I mean it's going to be fixed obviously as the months pass and developers you know update their apps to uh, support 3D touch but uh, what kind of irritates me now is that a lot of devs haven't updated yet, and I, I find myself um, not so much afraid of trying to use 3D Touch, but uh, you know when I when you use it in for say on on the home screen and it's not supported, um, the the quick action is not supported. It'll give you that haptic feedback, right? Whereas if you're in the app and it's not supported, it won't give you that, that the triple tap to tell you that um, the phone did register 3D touch, but it's just not supported in that specific UI. So um, you kind of have like this. Uh, you're sort of lost in a did it yeah, work, you, did it not work kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Where, whereas like on watch, um, you, it's kind of system-wide. Um, a thing with a force touch, right? I mean, if you try to force touch somewhere that it's not supported, you'll get the haptic and you'll get the, the visual and in some cases audio. Whereas on iPhone, it's it's not like that. Only quick actions is that supported. And then when you go into an app and 3D touch is not supported, it won't give you that feedback to tell you that it's, you know, it's not yet enabled yet. So that's kind of a, a misstep by Apple I don't know. I mean, it it's a different um, it's a different. There, I mean, iOS apps are built differently than the watch apps, right? I mean, they're the the legacy iOS apps obviously won't have support for 3D Touch, whereas the um, Apple Watch apps to get on the Apple Watch, you're going to have to meet that criteria. So it does support Force Touch, uh, even if you know. It well, force touch is also some, a very consistent thing where it's basically you press hard on the watch and it pops up another layer of buttons that wouldn't mm -hmm. otherwise fit on the screen. Where with 3D touch, it's consistent on the home page. So when you're in um, yeah. the 
when you're looking at icons, every icon that you hit does something. It either does something useful, like like most uh, most of Apple's apps. There's some that don't do anything. Um, you know, calculator's not going to do anything. Uh, there's an increasing number of third-party apps like Twitter or something that pop up something, whether it's useful or not. Uh, but if you have an app that doesn't do anything, it you get this kind of feedback. However, but if yeah. you had that going all the time, uh, most of most of your environment is either you know you're looking at a web page or text field like notes or something like that, and there's currently nothing that triggers when you do a deep press, and so nothing yeah. happens. So if you just had some sort of default you know bump bump nothing's happening, then you'd be running into that a lot when you're trying to just select text or something, I think. Whereas mm. having nothing happen means that it, something only happens when there's something that can happen. So when you right. hit a document right. or a photo or, or a URL or something like that, it actually does something where you don't really have a target. Yeah. You don't need to have... Yeah, I guess it would get kind of uh, clunky if it, if it was always vibrating. Okay, so, so I want to ask... You, you guys are clearly sticking with the 6S or the 6S Plus. You're, you're sticking with the plus size, Dan, but begrudgingly. Mikey, which device are you sticking with? Um, I'm not I'm not totally certain yet. I mean, I, I do, like Dan, appreciate the gargantuan screen size. It, it's really nice to look at, um, especially browsing the web. Uh, it's, it's way better than the uh the 4.7 inch version i mean anything bigger is better for the web uh but then again i mean pocketability and just overall uh usage like every day like if i'm texting while you know walking or something i with the 6s plus i'd have to look at the screen or look at my phone to make sure i'm not going to drop it because i'm i'm balancing it on my fingers whereas in you know the 6s i'll have it securely uh, grasped in my hand. So mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm not really sure. The jury's out. I have a out. solution for that problem, and I'll tell you about it after the show. But what I want to ask, I mean, we, we know this was a huge launch, right? They sold 13 million units in the first three days. There's, there's no question that this was a good launch for Apple, right? Or was it? Well, go on. <laughs> no, I... Well, you I opened just... that door. Go on. <laughs> it's uh, I mean, yeah. People are... I mean, the pundits are saying, of course, you know, with China being one of the launch day uh, countries, it clouds the, the fact that um, uh, the, the mix, we don't know the, the exact mix. But on the other hand, um, China did sell out of its launch day supply, just like the US and Europe. So um, in that respect, it, it is capped and it met or exceeded Apple. Apple's expectations. So, any way you look at it, it's a good launch. The numbers there, whether it was because of China or not, it was a record. Um, and, and if I, you look I at can, previous I, the previous yeah. launches, every year it's been this thing where the you know holiday launch Q1 is this huge surge, and then it sort of goes down and it sort of goes down. iPhone six wasn't like that. iPhone six was a huge surge, and yeah, then right. in a large part because China didn't launch it until later, mainland China. You had this huge second surge in the January, February, March quarter, and then it stayed high, and yeah, it stayed high yeah. again. And so everybody's saying, "Oh, I don't know if the 6s is going to match that." And it's like I don't, I don't think you you've noticed. It's not this typical huge surge and then drop off, waiting for another exciting phone. It's a huge demand that's right. broad and sustained, and that's just going to segue right. into here's a nicer phone, and then the six is now cheaper. So you're going to have two yeah. groups of people that are buying. One that was, you know, more um, worried about the cost, and the other that wants the latest, greatest thing. So you're going to have two, you know, mini surges that are going to keep going here. Um, right. Uh, to have people say that these pundits that are like, oh, I don't know if the six is going to be able to match, or the six S is going to be able to match the six. What a silly thing to even suggest. And we have what no think, indication that the things are slowing down. Yeah, what I think analysts are going to have to start recognizing, especially with um, Apple's upgrade plan, is uh, not so much focusing on the new device sales on the launch, but how a new when when a new phone launches, what that does to um, you know back channel and, and old or older models, because I mean that's going to become a much more relevant uh, uh, avenue of 
of profit for for Apple in the in the coming years. With you know, I mean, I mean, even carriers are pushing. Um, they're they're kind of laying off the subsidies, so people are kind of forced to go with the older phones if they. I mean, old. It's a year old. I mean, you know, last year's model. So they're gonna have to start building that into their their own, you know, analysis. Right. Contracts are going away. Currently I'm under a Verizon contract for one more year, but after that they're they're willing to even be willing to offer me a contract. It'll be pay by month for whatever. And with the increase in these kind of leasing programs that both Apple and the carriers are doing in the West and have been in doing other places, uh, you're gonna have a lot of secondhand phones. And I don't see a lot of secondhand sales. Which right. kind of suggests that Apple is shipping those to other countries. And whenever I see a bunch of new things happening, you think, what's going to happen to this stuff after a period of time? Like, <laughs> I was just in Dubai, and you're seeing all these buildings that are being created, and you know they're all brand new for now, but it's like, when you have scale happening that fast, what happens in 10 or 20 years when these buildings are old? And they were thrown up, they're poorly built. The same thing in China. There's all this stuff that's just rapidly being thrown up. It's not maintained, it's not done very well. What happens when it starts to get old? It's not classic, it looks... It looks like the 90s. It's going to be awful. And um, kind of thinking about that in terms of iPhones, you have all these brand new phones and millions of phones that are shipping every weekend. What happens to the old phones? And some of them trailed off. It used to be that Apple's growth was, was so tremendously fast that the older generations almost didn't matter because the, the new generation was growing so much faster. Uh, but now we have a situation where there's tons of new, there, there's more new phones, new iPhones being sold than ever. And yet, we know that at some point, you know, you're going to reach saturation. What happens? How do you sustain growth? And I think one of the things is Apple's going to have phones that are a year or two years old that are still, you know, really good phones that they can sell in other markets. And that includes, right. you know, markets like India, where right, that are right. currently being targeted by Samsung and other companies with sort of lower and cheaper phones that aren't that good. Mm -hmm. They're certainly not as good as a you know year or two year old iPhone. So I think that's going to be a big opportunity for growth going forward. Another Sadly, thing, they're not getting any phones from me because I. Uh, do you keep all your phones down? Or? <laughs> for them. I, don't, I have an Apple museum that I drag around. <laughs> oh, good lord. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm really bad at selling things, and I'm sort of a hoarder. Um, I, I think at some point I just need to find a space where I can display all this stuff and start charging admission. Nice. <laughs> well, you, you remember Jobs donated all the old stuff to Stanford. There's no reason that you need to haul it around too. They have, yeah, they have the, uh, the computer museum in uh, what's it, San Jose? Yeah. yeah. But then you have to go to San Jose to see it. Oh. Ugh. I, another well, thing. <laughs> I, I have an original <laughs> iPhone somewhere. It's it's gone missing. I have um, I have a couple of iPhone three Gs hanging around. And other than that, I have sold through all of my old devices. I, I know I do have an Apple TV Model 1 around as well. I've given away a lot of my phones to, to friends and stuff. But, yeah, I have a lot of – I still have an, the original G5 Power Mac that cool. with a huge screen that – I have my first G4 Power Mac. It's not fun to carry around. <laughs> but I do it anyway. But talking about China, so one, one other thing uh, I think Mikey mentioned on, in China, you know, one of the things they said was, oh, yeah, it's 30% more sales, but that includes China. And one thing that nobody, that I've noticed that nobody's observed is Apple was blocking sales of, um, what do you call them, scalper type sales, where they just send a bunch of people into stores, and they're really cracking down on that. Right, they were limiting the amount of phones that a person can buy at a time. Right, and you have to reserve it in a lot of countries. You can't just like walk in and say, "Hey, I want to, you know, however many phones you'll sell me, and then I'm going to come back tomorrow and do it again." You have to actually res create a reservation so that Apple's sort of tracking what you're doing. Um, that has all been kiboshed. So there's this huge channel of back industry. And when I was in Hong Kong and, and going into China, you see there's a huge market for smuggling stuff into the country. There's all kinds of, of mainland people that come into uh, particularly Hong Kong and get stuff and bring it back through to resell it at a big markup. So part of the initial surge that we've seen in previous years has involved that kind of black marketing of stuff. So that's missing, and that's kind of a significant thing. I mean, that, that's the kind of thing that hits the first couple days during the launch 
is a lot of those sales are being, you know, packed up to sell somewhere else. And it also, you see a lot of it in the U.S., in San Francisco and in New York and other international cities, there's a lot of people that come from other places to um, buy inventory. And so with Apple cracking down on that, there's less, well, there's less of a kind of packing the inventory of the black market sales and more actual real people organic sales of people actually buying it. So the, the idea that there isn't really growth is, I don't think that's true at all. We were talking a little bit about 3D Touch at the beginning. What are the best 3D Touch apps for your phone? My, Mikey, what are the best apps that you found that support 3D Touch? Um, I mean, right now, it's obviously any of Apple's first-party apps. I use it a lot in Mail. I use it a lot in Safari. Um... Where else do I use it? I don't really use it that often in the third-party apps that support it. Do you, Dan? I haven't used a lot of third-party apps that I've seen have a tremendous use for it. Um, right now, I think it's only it's really been out for a few days. And so I think most of the developer support for it is just kind of throwing it on their homepage icon, putting a quick action, which is quite easy to do. And I think we'll see more interesting things roll out later. Uh, what are the... There are a couple things that don't get mentioned so much. For example, when you're in camera, when you do hard press on where how you, the, the photo icon that you'd use to jump into to, um, photos, you can actually scroll through your photos and preview them. And then when you let go, you're back into the camera. So it's like little things like that that let you jump between apps. Um, that's actually a useful, fast navigation trick that you can do that you couldn't really do Otherwise, right. You can preview the photos that you've taken without actually leaving the camera context. Right. That's what you're telling me. So, Dan, Mikey, let me, let me ask. El Capitan came out yesterday. Have you guys installed it yet? I've been running the beta versions, um, and uh, I did not install the uh, shipping version, but I did install the GA. Okay, but there is a difference between the GM and the one that actually was released to the public. So you may want to install the... Uh... Yeah, I haven't gotten a chance, though. Okay. Dan, are you running El Capitan? So I have been running betas on a separate machine that I don't use on a daily basis, but I've been working on it. Um, when it came out, um, I only have mobile service right now on my T-Mobile phone. So um, I packed up my computer and ran down to the Apple Store thinking I would get blazing fast... Wi-Fi, and set it up to download the uh, the new OS, and it said it would take six hours. And I left it there for a while, you know, I was like doing things, and it made very little progress in an unreasonable amount of time, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll do this later. And then I came home, and I thought, maybe I should just see, I, I have an extra phone. Um, so T -Mo I, I switched to T-Mobile, and they give you tremendous amounts of data. Well, especially for, if you have two lines, right? You yeah. The... So I have I have an extra phone that I could use, and I thought, well, sure, I'll just do it, and it sucked it up in half an hour. This huge OS update, I, I think six gigs. Right. It also ate like you, you've got four gigs remaining on that line now. Yeah, probably. Well, it's okay. <laughs> um, the other thing I want to say about T-Mobile is I I switched it over right before I I was in Europe, and amazing. Simple every global work every for you. country I, I went to, except for, well, I, was, I flew over Turkey and you know, I got a text message because I left my phone on and the plane didn't crash. But <laughs> I, I did get a text message saying that Turkey wasn't one of the countries. But everywhere else, um, every country I went into, you cross a border and it says, hello, welcome to this country. Um, you have free T-Mobile. And it's, it's 3G, 3G data, so it isn't blindingly fast. I think you could pay more for 4G data. I didn't, I didn't look into that. But wow, when you're traveling, it's so nice to be able to step off a plane and be able to do everything and search for things and have maps. And wow, it was amazing. And it's nice. included. It's free. And T-Mobile is cheaper. The only thing is that T-Mobile doesn't really work very well as a carrier in the U.S. As a phone carrier. Like every phone call I get, I answer it and it hangs up. Ooh. And either all my phones are rude or uh, all my friends are rude. Or, <laughs> well, for, or first of all, yes, all work. your friends are rude. But, yeah, yeah, you probably should report that. Yeah, so I, I don't really get amazing phone service. But, wow, when you're not in the country, it sure is amazing. 
It's and the data cool. surface is actually pretty pretty good. It, it's a little flaky. Um, traveling in Northwest California and up the five, there were a couple places where I had no service whatsoever. But um, uh, in in most cities, you get pretty fast service. Nice. Well, I installed El Capitan yesterday. I have not been running the betas. I, I ran all the betas for Yosemite, and I decided this was my time to just stay with stable OSs. And uh, so I installed El Cap yesterday, and it has been smooth sailing for me. I've seen some people that have had problems with things like networking and network consumption. But for the most part, my biggest issue, the only issue I had was uh, on one machine, it didn't want to install at first until I'd done a reboot, and then it allowed me to install. And the other one was, uh, but that, that one was brilliant because it said, we can't install on Macintosh HD. No reason why. No, no actual error message other than just, we can't go home. And I'm, I'm like, Apple, can't you give me a better reason than we just simply can't? So I rebooted the machine, and then the install worked there. I, I use AirDrop, and I know everyone complains about AirDrop, but I like sending photos from my phone to my computer via AirDrop, and I like using Handoff. And the first time that I used AirDrop, it took about five minutes for the computer to recognize that a file was coming over from the phone. But after that, it's been so fast. It's been lightning. And I've been really pleased with El Capitan. I need to get a new MacBook because mine, mine's getting pretty slow. <laughs> and also, uh, it's just old enough to where it doesn't really support continuity stuff. How old is it? 2011. Okay. So uh, it sort like... of does. There's, there's a few things that sort of work, but um, AirDrop doesn't. AirDrop only works between Macs, I think. No, I had AirDrop working with, with the 2011 MacBook Air for a I while. I thought there was... I, I, I dinked with it for a minute, and I thought I had it working, it, and then... It now, should totally work. It should be there. Yeah. I would, I would suggest that you do a clean install of El Capitan to, a, to an external drive and see if it doesn't work, and if it doesn't, then there's your answer. But my expectation is it should on 2011, because it's got Bluetooth low energy in there. I, it does, but I think it's, there's something else that uh, is not supported. But the, just in general, I need a new Mac, and I'm trying to decide if I want to get a super light thin MacBook, new thing, or uh, a more pro model that would be faster yeah. oh, for a variety of things. So I don't tough know, call. travel a lot. I would. Uh, yeah, light when good. you're traveling is a big deal. Yeah. But the um, the MacBook is not desktop computer so I may have to get a retina iMac with it uh, I'm also I'm also pretty eye. stoked about the new iPad Pro yeah and we got a lot of interest we're, we're looking at the uh, the videos that we did at mm -hmm. the uh, event and the, the biggest number of views on YouTube by quite a wide margin was the ones on the iPad Pro I would like to see if you could use an iPad Pro as a primary machine. It's pretty fast. You say this every time a new iPad comes out. <laughs> I've been thinking about doing this since 2010, and I'm still ready. Uh, I, I'm the person that doesn't own any iPad at all right now, so I, I've got nothing else to do but ask Dan to take the fall for me. Oh, Dan. Sad. It is an interesting form factor. It's kind of a sort of a new segment. It's things that other people have sort of tried, but no one's really pulled it off. How did the uh, how did the speakers sound? Well, where I used it, it wasn't it wasn't easy to get a good sense of that. Yeah, yeah, in the demo hall, when everyone else around you is talking and filing reports, it's not really conducive to jacking up the speakers. How yeah. dare you? They are they are superb. They are they are Horrible. sublime. Yeah. They are sublime for playing sublime. Today's episode is brought to you by the incorporation experts at Biz Filings. For a job done right, you've got to go to the experts. And when it comes to incorporation, that means bizfilings.com. There, the process is clearly laid out for you with a step-by-step -step guidance from on-demand professionals. Incorporation can bring you savings, protections, and growth. So don't just do it on any old website. Biz Filings has been at it for nearly 20 years, founded by entrepreneurs who set out to create the kind of experience they'd want if they had to do it all over again. Straightforward information, clarifying tools, and instant access to experts via email, phone, or chat. You may not have incorporation all figured out just yet, but a quick visit to BizFilings is a step in the right direction. Go to bizfilings.com slash start for a free guide to get a clear line of sight into your incorporation. That's bizfilings.com slash start. 
So the Apple Music trial is up. We had three months of free Apple Music, and now it's going away. So let me ask, are, are you guys subscribing? Did you guys really take advantage of Apple Music? How did you use it when you had it? I was traveling during much of that period, so I didn't use it extensively. Um, my friends that I was traveling with used it a lot and likes it. I, um, I really like being able to, when you're thinking of a song, just pull it up and it's there. So that was really cool. And being able to access videos, I really like videos. And yes, I automatically subscribed because I got a letter from Tim Cook saying, you've already paid. <laughs> we billed your credit card. So yeah, I'm, I'm a subscriber. So you haven't managed your subscription to turn that off? You've I, just I, kind of gone with it? Uh, I, I really don't do that with any service that I subscribe to. I'm paying for Hulu and Netflix. And I'm kind of, anytime I subscribe to anything, I, yeah, I be for the month club. They just keep piling up my doorstep. Until you move, of course. Yeah, I'm, and then, I'm a very bad, very bad shopper. Dan, I've got a subscription that I'd like to go ahead and sell you. I'll yeah. tell you about it after the show. And, uh, I'm kind of a sucker for anything that... That's fantastic. I'm going to take advantage of that. Yeah, everybody does. <laughs> Mikey, are you listening to Apple Music? I am. Um, I'm going to... I mean, I'm, I'm still... Still uh, still debating whether to keep... I mean, I, I also got billed yesterday. Got a nice email. Um, but so far I'm finding it on par with, uh, Spotify, Spotify, as far as content goes, there's not much that Apple music or Spotify has over the other, and I can find what I want to on both. Um, so, so if you can find what you want to on both, what's it going to take to get you to stick with one? Well, it doesn't hurt that uh, Apple's is built into the OS, so um, that helps. Searching, Spotlight, all that integration okay. helps, helps a lot. So it's, it's coming down to the integration and the accessibility to finding what you want wins out over the other service. So you're probably going to stick with Apple Music instead of Spotify, is that correct? I'm probably going to stick with both because... <laughs> because you're made of money and who cares? <laughs> yes, I subscribe to all the services. Well, I mean, I think that it's my... It's kind of a... It's your patriotic uh, duty as an well, American. No, it, I mean, there are things that I might need to write about and having a subscription will keep me in the loop, so to speak. Okay, but absent your, your job as a writer... Mm -hmm. which one would you choose personally? You wouldn't simply splash out for all of the things because... I don't know. I I really dislike Apple Music's UI. Spotify is, to me, much cleaner and easier to navigate um, than the hidden pop-up menus that Apple Music relies on. Um, so if... It, if if it wasn't built into the OS and all things were equal, I would, I would probably choose Spotify. Interesting. Well, Although I am the, not. The videos I, do. Uh, they are compelling. And the exclusives. And have you looked at any of the exclusives? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, I can wait a couple weeks until it comes out on another service. Okay. Well, I'm not subscribing. I, the first thing I did when I agreed to the trial was manage my subscriptions to tell it to not automatically renew. And I, I chose that because I just I don't like paying any of these subscription services. I, I'm not a fan of paying for Spotify. I'm not a fan of, fan of paying for Pandora. I don't pay uh, Apple Music. And I'm just not convinced what any of them can do to get me to become a subscriber. I bet you want your... Your internet news for free, too. No ads, huh? you goddamn right. <laughs> um, what do you think about the inevitable uh, Apple TV subscription? Do you think, um, you think that's going to happen? I, it, it's entirely possible, and it may be more attractive. You know, we, we do pay for Netflix, we do pay for Hulu, and we, we sprung for the Hulu with no advertisements, which, to be honest, is quite nice. 
Um, and yeah, I'm kind of bummed that I, I paid for Hulu, and you're sitting there watching the stuff you paid for, and it's like, here's another app, here's another app, here's another app. Right. And it's the and same so, ad over and over again. You, you yes, watch it a series is. You get of episodic three ads television, across 45 like, really? minutes. Yeah. Do I have yeah. to watch this ad again? Can you show me another one? Well, no. No, we cannot, Dan. You're going to have to see the same advertisement again. I want, I want to see different ads if I have for to watch the next ads. 45 minutes. Ads. Yes. No, I I went up to the twelve dollar a month to to get rid of the ads, and I'm glad that I did. You know, I we we don't have pay TV, so so I've pretty much excised commercials from my daughter's experience of of watching any televised material, and I'm happy oh, about yeah. that. I never thought of that. <laughs> For, what would it be like to grow out with any out any kind of commercials at all? I know and it'd be amazing, right? That's the way I've raised them. They don't have they have, they have never experienced a commercial unless they're at someone else's house or for a while while they were watching Hulu. But now that's excised, so it's completely advertisement free. I'm waiting Although for the do... Microsoft technology where you stand up and you say Microsoft or McDonald's. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> yes, that patent <laughs> that was brilliant. Stand up and shout McDonald's for your show to continue. Cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> please, please, TV gods, let me see some more football. Yeah, of course. <laughs> now, I if if and when there's an Apple TV subscription, if it offers the things that we care about to see, then it's entirely possible, especially if it's price competitive. You know, it, it could take Hulu out of competing for us and give us an Apple subscription. We'd totally do it. The original argument that I made when we cut cable, we were, so. For three months, I went back and forth with my wife, and every night we'd look at, at – at that time we were using TiVo, and we had cable. And I'd look at the guide, and I'd say, well, there's a Law & Order episode on. And she'd be like, nah, I've seen them. And we'd turn the TV off. And every night for three months, we looked at each other and said, there's nothing we actually care to see on. And after three months, I said, can we please stop paying for this? And we finally cut it. And my big pitch was we can get an Apple TV, and we can buy the seasons that we actually care about. And that was the argument. We bought an Apple TV, and we never actually did that. We never actually once subscribed to a season of television through Apple TV because Netflix was there, and it just sort of worked. So it's going to come down to what an Apple TV service provides that makes us buy in. I have a really well, hard I mean, yeah. time. It's, like I was saying, it's much easier for me to pay for a subscription, whether I use it or not, than to pay for um, a la carte stuff. So when I'm when I'm on iTunes, I think, do I want to pay for this show? And it's like yeah. ninety nine cents. I don't know if I want to pay that. That's a lot of money. Three ninety nine for a movie. I mean, and then come I'll on. spend months and months where I'm not watching any television at all. But I'm paying, you know, Netflix and Hulu both eight or nine dollars or whatever to, per month. I'm, I'm that's something you know, like twenty dollars a, a month. I could have spent sixty dollars on the things I actually wanted to watch. So I think if Apple had sort of a way. To offer a subscription that gave you a certain, even if it wasn't completely unlimited, if you had like tiers that was sort of priced in the way that mobile data is. Mm -hmm. So you say, I'm paying you this much for watching TV occasionally. I mean, that winds into overages where you've reached your limit just as you're watching something. Yeah, but I could see saying like, okay, I've, I've watched a lot of TV this month, I, I want to watch this other show too, and you pay like an extra nine nine cents for that show. Hmm. But just if it was just like sort of a bundle, as opposed to because there's kind of a threshold, it's kind of hard to start. I do start like that all you can things. eat nature of things though. That all you can eat nature of it is is convenient because yeah. But there's some people that can eat more than I can. I don't want to pay as much for television as somebody who just sits and watches TV all day long. You're, you're paying two hundred and forty bucks a year. Well. That's that's not a huge amount compared to previous cable packages. That's not a huge amount. Oh, you on mean its for? Own. I mean, you're, for for what you're paying for your Netflix and your Hulu, you're nominally paying. Say it's it's yeah, 20, but there's no, there's a lot that isn't on Netflix or Hulu. Yes, that's true, and I simply don't care anymore. Yeah. I, I if it's not on either of those things, I I give zero. I just don't care. Yeah, I don't watch enough to where I have a huge demand for something that's not on there. But I would like to have something where I could watch anything that I want as opposed to being forced to watch sort of second rate stuff. I apparently also pay for, I mean, I'm, I pay for Amazon prime, but whenever I've looked at Amazon prime, but, I mean, I can't do it on Apple TV. 
a and, ton of people don't pay for Amazon Prime and don't yeah. use it for instant video, though. That's that's kind of the exception. I think that's why it we saw Netflix the news today. Look broad and varied, yes. Right. That's that's why we saw the news saying that Amazon is going to start uh, disallowing sales of Apple streaming and Google streaming devices on Amazon.com. Is they're trying to figure out ways to to bolster and push sales of Fire TV and and Amazon instant video use. Apple makes it look so easy to roll out stuff and have people buy it. It must be so frustrating for Google and Microsoft and Amazon. They keep rolling out the stuff and nobody buys it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the Google rolled out the Chromecast and Chromecast Audio the other day, and it, it prompted me to dig out my old last year's Chromecast. I had to search for two days to find it, if you can believe. And um, I, I updated the software on that. It took six reboots to get it to actually update. And... Uh, it, it functions. I don't know why I'd need to go buy the new one, to be honest. I'm, I'm not even sure what benefit I would derive from doing the new device compared to the one that updated. Yeah, and that's and supposed to be this terribly successful device that, you know, cost $35. They did not make money on it. They were clearing them out at Target the other day just to make room for the new one to come in. So... I, I, that's, that's the verdict. I'm not subscribing to Apple Music. You guys are by virtue of continuing to subscribe to it. Um, I want to talk about SoftLayer. SoftLayer develops a cloud built for innovation. Your business, your applications, your computational workloads are unique, so you deserve cloud resources that meet your needs. And SoftLayer is one of the only cloud providers that provisions dedicated servers and virtual servers from a single seamless platform on demand connected to the same open API and all connected to the same global private network. SoftLayer is an IBM company, and IBM uses SoftLayer as its cloud infrastructure foundation for all of IBM's cloud products and services. All of our listeners have the opportunity to get $500 of cloud infrastructure by visiting softlayer.com slash podcast with a capital P. You can order bare metal servers, you can order virtual servers, and security services from your choice of data center from across 24 data centers around the world. You can automate and control your cloud infrastructure with a granular API or in the easy-to-use SoftLayer customer portal. Visit softlayer.com slash podcast with a capital P to get started with your $500 off servers, storage, network, and security on a cloud built for innovation from SoftLayer. Movie news. Aaron Sorkin, Tim Cook, and the Steve Jobs film. So we had an article that went up about Aaron Sorkin apologizing for remarks that he made about Tim Cook. What, what was, what's, what's, this, what's this going back and forth between Sorkin and Tim? Uh, free publicity for Sorkin. Free publicity for Sorkin for for Aaron and his movie, but what's what was what was the tiff about? Um, well, I mean, uh, Tim Cook went on uh, late night with uh, Stephen Colbert, and the conversation got around to um, Steve Jobs and um, all of these, you know, the movies and documentaries and books about it and cook made a made a comment about how he feels some of them are being opportunistic in their endeavors Mm -hmm. um slightly directed at at sorkin but not directly could have been directed Um, to any one of them right yeah i mean the, the way what uh colbert asked specifically about the steve jobs movie um, but I think Cook was speaking more in general terms, and I, Sorkin, I guess saw or felt that he was slighted in some way, and made a remark about how Tim Cook shouldn't. He, he's calling the uh, he's a pot calling the kettle black. Um, he made a he made mention of. Foxconn and worker wages and so so the quote the stuff. quote that was is if you've got a factory full of children in China assembling phones for seventeen cents an hour you got a lot of nerve calling someone else opportunistic right right uh, which is funny coming from I'm not gonna get it but I mean you know <laughs> it first apples, of all there aren't children assembling phones for seventeen yes, cents an hour yes. first of all. That doesn't happen. What happens is there are people, there are workers, and Apple has a rigorous program of inspecting factories and making sure that they comply with all the rules and and that they actually have programs to help people 
get degrees to get education in the factory so that factory workers can better themselves, not just move up to assembling the next best thing on the factory line. Yeah, but I mean, we can't, there are worker, there are some egregious things going on in China that, you know, can't be overlooked or can't be, Apple cannot be blamed for everything that there there may be egregious things going in china but are they things that are egregious going on in apple's factories um clearly apple makes a lot of effort to make that not be the case i don't think it's a hundred percent everywhere i mean even in their report it's not a hundred percent that you know every single factory is um is complying with their their rules and they they do try they do give a valiant effort in trying to weed those suppliers out, but at the same time, the worker standards there are not nowhere near what they are in the U.S., for example. Okay. But then again, I mean, is it Apple's responsibility to uh, export U.S. socioeconomic policy to other countries? I don't know. Um, but I, I just don't, I, I think Sorkin's comments were off base. And so, how did Sorkin back out of this? No, what, was, what was his big answer after coming, you know, two barrels wide open on the? He you're just a said that both parties, both parties went too far. <laughs> Speaking for so, Cook. so he's kind of apologizing for Tim Cook on his behalf. Yeah. Yes. But but so, even the comments that he made, I mean, what he said was sort of dramatically inflated fiction. And that's kind of the same thing as oh, it's a movie. You know, there's elements that the names, some of the names are the same, but you know, if you know any of his people, the kind of yeah. the way that he like over dramatizes mm-hmm. things. That's what Hollywood does: is they, you know, they take names and they create a story around them that's dramatic and exciting and tear jerking yeah. and whatever. And it's not really yeah. real. And when I see these movies about Steve Jobs, I wish they would they would just call them something like Citizen Kane. Because, you know, they could make sort of a caricature of a general group of people that are sort of like, you know... It's not a movie about Hearst. It's about Kane. Yeah. And, you know, they they could have done that without saying, this is Steve Jobs and here, you know, it's actually fiction. And it's Steve Jobs saying about a lot of things that Steve Jobs didn't say. And I have no problem. things in sort of a whack... Well, yeah, I mean, I, I've, I have no problem with these, with movies like uh, Kutcher's movie or and the upcoming Sorkin movie. Um, because they're clearly labeled as works of fiction based on events, right? I mean, it's not... Yeah, but when people watch that, they think that they're watching a documentary. I mean, maybe they, maybe well, they know in general that, yeah, it's kind of dramatized in parts, but there's a lot of times, especially, you know, kids see a movie. Um, remember dude, that, that's history. I saw it on the movie. Yeah, it's like that's their sense of what actually happened is when you watch movies about, you know, the Civil War or, or anything, and they're presenting something that's just completely not true. People think that that's what happened, and so I think, yes, I think if you're also, writing stuff, you have somewhat of a responsibility to, you know, clearly delineate that you're writing about something that happened in Silicon Valley, not a specific person that you're you know, just dramatizing to the point where it's you know not really even true at all. Right. I, well, viewers also have a responsibility to take it, you know, upon themselves to research these things for them. You know. Now I know you're crazy. Viewers don't no, have I, any responsibility. The viewer's responsibility begins and ends with, I paid some money for a movie ticket, and I'm going to go enjoy this thing. That's, that's where you're, they have no responsibility to check the accuracy of what's being presented to them. Come on. <sighs> we live in a sad world. But Are you I'm kidding just, me? <laughs> uh, I, I have more of an issue with the uh, you know, quote-unquote documentaries um, that parade themselves as being uh, objectionable and, you know, uh, yeah, with objective, you know, presenting a, uh, the objective documentary right. with my strong bias as a filmmaker. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously a slant to them, and I, I think they. Well, so when you make those, a documentary, you have to tell some kind of story, and you have to decide what story the, the story is you're going to tell, and how you arrange your your pieces of footage to tell that story. It's documentary because you're not shooting fiction, you're not shooting actors, you're not shooting recreation, unless you blatantly say this was a reenactment but it's still very much the the director and the editor's viewpoint that's coming across right it's a documentary yeah, it's not so much journalism, to express yeah. it's not journalism and it's not <laughs> it's not cinema verite where we're simply going to start the cameras rolling 
and we're going to capture everything in consecutive order. No, it's, it's simply, here's my opinion, and I'm using footage not made by actors to show you what I think. Mm-hmm. That's what a documentary is. So it's, it's also not the one truth. It's that director's truth. Yeah, there's a thin line between documenting and propaganda, what you're saying. Here's something I want everyone to think, and I'm pushing it out there so that everyone has some evidence supporting my opinion. I'm trying to think of a documentary that hasn't been propaganda in some form, and I'm having trouble. Well, I mean, there's varying degrees of how <laughs> uh, Ken Burns. Uh, Ken Burns on um, the yeah, series on jazz. I'll I'll give Ken Burns to you. Mm-hmm. Um, Although his Civil War series was a bit one-sided. Well, the Civil War was kind of one-sided. I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave that hanging there because uh, <laughs> I don't want to get into what. What side do you want better do you represented? Wanna, do you want to get into no, it? No. no. <laughs> sure. All right. We, we, we can go into what side of the Civil War you wish had been better represented and represented more fairly later, but not on this show. So, Mikey, I, normally we go to, to Neil for cameras and things like this, especially with GoPro, but you, you've got a GoPro session. Tell me about the, the GoPro. Um, I've been testing it for a couple weeks. It's a neat little camera, but I don't see much um, right now in this current generation of hardware that makes it appealing, um, especially at the price point. I mean, for the same price, you can get uh, well, better specs. All right, hold on. So there yeah. was a price cut on the session. Tell me, what is the price right now? I don't know. What is the price? You tell me. Oh. Okay, if we're going to do that. Um, the the Hero check. 4 session got price reduced to $300. It was 400 and is now reduced to 300 And they simultaneously mm-hmm. launched a $200 Hero Plus camera. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, I mean, $300 and, is, a, is a better price point for it. But for what it offers, it still falls a little short of the standard format. Uh, GoPro heroes. Right. So the session for our our listeners is a camera unit without the traditional GoPro form factor. So the screen has been hacked off. Uh, It's it's basically shrunk down to be a cube of a camera, basically. It's extremely compact Mm -hmm. and it's waterproof, apparently. Yeah. Where everything else from the, the, the GoPro line requires a waterproofing case that you encase the camera into. So... Right. If, if you're in a water environment and you need the small camera and you don't care about the screen, then this makes sense, right? Right, right. It, it, it's good for um, people who already own other Hero cameras as uh, perhaps a, uh, a B-roll camera or maybe something you just want to have on your body at all times. Um, but if you're getting a, a GoPro, as this, this isn't going to be the one that you should get first, I think. Okay, so what do you recommend our listeners get first? Um, the Hero 4 Silver is good, a good start. Okay. What um, about the Hero Plus, 200 bucks? It's a nice, easy entry price point? Yeah, I mean, that's great. If you don't care about the, the screen, then, I mean, um, definitely go with that. Uh, but the Silver is a pretty great all-around shooter. Um, and it comes with a screen that people are familiar with, whereas the others, you know, you kind of just uh, point and, and pray that you, you grab the, the shot. Yeah. So, um, so let me ask, what are the things that someone should look for in an action camera? Because there's GoPro, and mm-hmm. there are all these other ones out there, and everyone chooses GoPro because they're the biggest and the best at it, right? Supposedly. Mm-hmm. But yeah. what, what do you think? Tell, tell our listener what they should value and how they should decide which camera to get. What, what should the priorities be based on? Um, well, I mean, beyond hardware, there, hardware specifications wise, the cameras out there are very similar. Um, format is a big consideration. The GoPro for some people might be a little, uh, unwieldy because of, I mean, it's kind of a boxy design, you know, with the, um, it's kind of difficult to hold in your hand, uh, but it does have the widest variety of mounts. So, I mean, there... Right, there's the head mount and there's the chest mount. and Right, and there's all sorts of third-party 
sticks and bike uh, mounts and yeah i mean there's all kinds of stuff out there for the gopro it's the most supported it it's like the iphone of action cameras right i mean it, it created like this cottage industry of accessories um based around their their mount so uh if you you don't like the gopro and you're looking for another kind of action camera i would just focus on uh, basically optics is one of the main things that is a is a drawback for these smaller cameras um, the GoPro has decent optics, it has a good sensor, um, and it has a good firmware to, to back it up. So what you want to look at is what kind of what kind of lens is being used, if it's going to be a fisheye, whether it has software to correct that, uh, what kind of internal um, hardware it's running as far as the, the chip goes doesn't really concern you. This processor speed and stuff because they're all basically the same and comparably uh, specced in that regard. Okay, so if you were recommending the camera, you're going to recommend someone get the silver. Is that right? What's that? If you're recommending a camera to someone, if you're, you're going to tell them to go get the GoPro Hero Silver. Yeah, I mean, if you're if you're in the market for, I mean, that's a, it's still pricey. It's four hundred dollars. Um, that's a good. It's a very solid entry. Their their cheaper one is also it's a good starter camera. I mean, if you just want to go out, take some footage of you surfing or whatever, um, the the entry model is is a good place to start. Cool, Dan. Have you ever shot anything with a GoPro? I had a contour camera that I used. That was the um, I got it to mount on my motorcycle and. Before I ever mounted it, I was in my last motorcycle accident, so I didn't catch the footage of that. But um, I had a waterproof casing for it. It's, it's very similar to, it's more, it's more like a barrel mount kind of thing, but it's similar to a GoPro, I guess. Okay, well, we're glad you're here after the motorcycle accident. Yeah, me too. Maybe you'll get a Hero Plus Silver after, or a Hero Silver after uh, Mikey's recommendation here. <laughs> Well, gentlemen, we've reached the end of our agenda. This is the Apple Insider Podcast. We've got our, uh, our, our roaming vagabond, Dan, here. Dan, where can people find you on the Internet? I'm on Twitter at Daniel Aaron, and I'm on Apple Insider. Excellent. And Mikey, M- Mikey, our contributing editor, where can people find you on the Internet? I'm at Apple Insider and on Twitter at MikeyCampbell81. Fantastic. Well, we will be back next week where Dan will be able to tell us all about the conflict that he's had, the internal struggle of dealing with the larger 6S Plus device. And Mikey will be back with a thesis on the sides of the Civil War that should be better represented. And I'm your host, Victor Marks. This has been the Apple Insider Podcast. Don't forget, if you want a job done right, you've got to go to the experts. And when it comes to incorporating your business, that means biz filings. With step-by-step guidance from on-demand experts, incorporating at biz filings is the next logical step. Head to bizfilings.com slash start and get things rolling with a free guide.